Welcome everyone. December 13th, the opening of SciArt 200 coming to you from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. We're located on the traditional territory of the Odnishoni and the Anishinaabe nations. McGill University has long regarded and respected these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and the waters that we live on, that we play on, that we exchange information, and we learn to understand the land, the water, the animals, the plants. Part of our understanding is learning through art. This show has been assembled by scientists at McGill University. They were asked about a year ago to submit pieces of art in any media, and it would mark the bicentennial 200 years of the university's um, presence here on the traditional territory of the Odnishoni and the Anishinaabe nations. I heard last week that um, one of the Anishinaabe teachings, one of the fundamental teachings is to preserve for your descendants, seven generations forward. And I think that's what we're doing, a little bit of that right now. We're marking 200 years, that's at least seven generations of life here. And we hope that these art pieces will be preserved for another few generations. The curator of this art exhibit, this virtual art exhibit is Milton Riano. He is also the climate change artist in residence for the year 2021 here at McGill University. He's taken on this role um, because he just found he couldn't refuse. This was a great chance for him to meet scientists who are also artistic. And he's taken over 60, there were over 60 works, individual works. They ranged from beadwork to three-dimensional knitted um, garments to um, photography, graphic art pieces. There were poems. He's taken these works and assembled them into a virtual art gallery. We're launching that tonight. We will get a guided tour with Milton. Please post your questions in the chat to the co-host or the host, that's Ken Reagan or me, Ingrid Berker, and we'll manage those with Milton, but we'll have to let him take the, take the, uh, the lead here. This is a brand new world. You're going to see art in a whole different way, virtually with Milton. Hi everyone, and thank you Ingrid for this introduction. Uh, hello to all the people who are joining our live, joining us live today, and also to the people who will be, watch this video in the future. So it is our pleasure to introduce to you this uh, new space. We call it uh, Sci R Two Hundred. It's a virtual gallery, which is also showing the works of many scientists and students and staff and alumni from McGill. Uh, to give you a, a little bit of, of a sense of uh, how big the art community is in McGill. So I'm going to start by sharing uh, my screen here. Oops, not this. Here. Let me just... Let me, just a second. Have to do it again. Portion of the screen. Oops. Sorry, I'm having issues sharing the screen right now. Oh, that's it. Can you see it now? Give me a thumbs up if you see it. Okay. So, uh, as I was mentioning, we are in the CIR 200 exhibition. Uh, when we finish this uh, meeting today, I'm going to be sharing the link uh, of this website. You can all visit the website at the same time. Uh, what you will see when you visit the website is this interface. So you have uh, the name of the room here, SciR200. Uh, this website is uh, created through Mozilla Hubs. So this is where we are locating all the pieces and also the interface that is showing you this exhibition. And then you have two options. You can spectate, which means you can see everything from the outside but nobody can see you, or you can join the room. So let's start by joining the room. I'm going to mute my microphone now and enter the room. And uh, this is what you will see when you enter the room. So we are just in front of Miguel, 
at the Roddick gates. And we have uh, two pieces of information here that I'm going to be uh, talking about in the, in the last part of the presentation. Uh, so let's start. The navigation in this website, it's, uh, it can be really complicated if you, <laughs> if you don't practice, but uh, you only have to push the, or press down the button W in your keyboard uh, you will see that it will start moving in one direction and then uh, you can use your uh, mouse to scroll around and for example you see if I point this direction the W will take me that way so uh, here I'm in the campus we just passed the Oshelaga stone and uh, we are located in the lower field so for this exhibition we wanted to have a we wanted to have a, a place where not only the, the pieces could be shown, but also people could join the space and interact with each other. So for example, when you have the link at the end of the presentation, uh, I think almost 50 people can enter at the same time and you can even chat with others through the gallery space. So I'm just uh, doing, uh, this is a path that I've done a lot of times uh, throughout my residency at McGill. I just enter in Sherbrooke Street at the Red Gates and then I go directly to the Red Flag Museum. Oh, there is a tip. If you want to move faster, you have to, you are, I'm pushing the W and then you push shift. It's like a turbo button. So we'll move faster. And I'm going to stop just a second here in front of the Red Flag Museum. So you can see all the pieces that are here located in the lower field. And uh, we have with us also some of the artists today. So Let's see how it goes. I'm going to move really fast to the lower field, so you can have a sense. I'm going to start to start to stand here in the middle, and right now I'm surrounded by art pieces, all of them created by by the McGill community. And the way in which we are presenting the pieces is. Um, a little bit straightforward, you can go uh, really close to a piece, for example. Let's see which one it's this. So right here, we're in the front of the piece, a piece made by Louis Philippe uh, Bateman, Bateman. And then uh, the name of the piece is Malmo Kissing. So we have some basic information for the pieces in case you are inter interested in uh, learning more about the technique or the art process of the artist. So we have here 3D modeling, Blender, and we have also the dimensions of the piece, as well as the year in which the piece was created. Uh, you can even, uh, oh, there is a tip as well. If you press the shift, the spacebar button, you will see that there is a new menu that appears here. So for example, if you check this button here, it will show you like a flat image of the piece, so you can see like the piece and read the information clearly. And uh, you can also open the link. This will take you to a different uh, window where you can uh, zoom uh, a little more if you if you're not really into the three D zooming. So because we are in a three D environment, we can go through the pieces, see them from all angles. So yeah, this is the way in which uh, we navigate the piece. And uh, also something that I forgot to mention is that uh, every time that you enter this, uh, this gallery, you will become an avatar. So this is something that might start happening a lot uh, with the metaverse and all this uh, migration to the digital universe. Uh, so this might be also a, 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 a new opportunity to, to start uh, getting involved in this kind of uh, environments and but also to to see the, the the limitations to see how you feel in these kind of environments we try to reproduce an outdoor space uh, and then when we place the the, the pieces uh, we encounter that we don't have the same restrictions that we find in the physical world right so for example as a piece that come that's really really small you can make it bigger and uh, there is another trick here uh, you can uh, press the the spacebar and uh, click this little uh, magnifier and then you can take the artwork with you for example if you like this one I don't know you can uh, 
move around the space and uh, the artwork will be with you all the time. You can do this only one, one artwork at a time. And uh, when I, you see that I, I'm trying to move a little bit here, I just wanted to show you something as well. So the avatar that I'm using here, uh, it's a little bird. Let me go close to this. Oh, we are here. The second piece that we have here is uh, was created by Ingrid Berger from the Red Plot Museum. Uh, it's uh, an experiment using different materials, especially like chemical materials, uh, and uh, you can feel like the little uh, snowflakes melting as you see the picture and also like the, 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 the power of the sun. And what I wanted to show you is that also we have here uh, this uh, object thing uh, on the top of the screen. You can use this uh, object to move uh, in a different way to the exhibition. So for example, oh, let me go back to English please. Sorry, I'm showing a lot of pieces. Uh, Okay, let's stop here for a second. Uh, I was talking about Ingress, but I know I'm in uh, Chimney Tops by Brian. I don't know if he's here. Uh, what I want to show you is that you can also put here this view button. And then it's like uh, coming out of... Uh, yeah, view. No, I cannot show you what I want to show you, but it's like a, it's, it's just a way to see you out of your uh, own avatar. Anyways, let's go back and I'm gonna give you a little uh, guided tour of the exhibition. And then uh, if uh, one of the artists is present, you can uh, say hi and uh, uh, give us a little introduction of the pieces. So, how do you or how to navigate this space? Uh, as part of my curatorial work, uh, I needed to choose a location for the pieces that made some kind of sense uh, to propose you a little, uh, let's say, a little trip uh, uh, through some kind of narrative. So the piece, the first piece that I chose for this trip uh, is uh, this uh, this photograph. Uh, taken by Charlotte Goldberg and uh, we start here in the glacial uh, showing a little bit of glacial change as you move to the right of this uh, of this uh, zone you will also find uh, that, the th that the topic of the Arctic and also of climate change was present in some of the works so for example uh, we have here uh, poetry this one was co uh, created by Chloe, Chloe Lego, and uh, it's called uh, "Last Letter to the Arctic." So you see that uh, the this idea of the the Arctic is also present in both of these works, and uh, it is very interesting to learn more about how, uh, especially scientists, use uh, are in their as part of uh, not only of their research, but also as tool of communication and as tool of exchange with others. So, let me just move a little bit. We continue here uh, and uh, we will find more uh, underwater images. Here we have uh, some drawing and then uh, a timeless video of uh, created by Laura Lartinoa. And uh, this is a great example of how a simple metaphor, for example, reversing the, the way in which we are watching a video can create powerful metaphors. For example, uh, here we see how the, the, the corals are bleaching, how uh, their symbiont or their inhabitants are leaving the, the coral. So this is, uh, yeah, only possible. And Laura is here with us today. Okay, Laura, can you hear us? Do you want to say something about this uh, this work? Now that you have you here. I don't see Laura. I'm just asking her to unmute. Maybe she can do it now. 
Yeah. Hey. Bye, Bye, Laura. Bye, Laura. Yeah, and you did a good job kind of explaining um, the idea behind the piece and using kind of the layering and watercolor process. Mm -hmm. Also explain um, a biological process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was reading that you, you created this piece as a part of a, a presentation, right? Like a scientific presentation. This was one of the pieces that was uh, shown during this presentation, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah, it was kind of an, a short, like three minute presentation on on my research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is... Uh, thank you, Laura. For, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I hear some uh, want some muted. Is it is it you, Laura? <laughs> so thank you, Laura, for giving us this uh, this uh, these words. And uh, you can also find more information about. I was mentioning this uh, thing about the that Laura used use this uh, this uh, animation as part of a of a presentation. You can find all this information in the link in the when you enter the website. Remember that there was a, a, a yellow link to know more about the pieces and the artists. There you can find more information about in which uh, contest the pieces were created uh, and also artist statements. So yeah, uh, I was saying that this, uh, for me this piece is also connected to the idea of climate change and uh, of uh, anthropogenic uh, pressures over the environment. And uh, there we have, uh, oops, this one is missing this car. This one is called uh, Beauty in Peril Agrochemicals. Oh, let me just... I'm going to be back at this one because I am I'm missing the car. Uh, then we continue underwater. This time uh, we have uh, Victoria Maria Glynn. I think she's also present. Yeah, she is. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Milton. Hi, Ingrid. How are you? Good. Uh, Thank you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this piece? Yeah, sure. So my research focuses on corals and their interactions with microorganisms. Mm -hmm. But I realize that oftentimes there's a lot of dynamics ecologically and biologically that we can't appreciate because we can't see them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they're not as important. We just visually to the naked eye, we, we can't perceive them. That's what I was trying to highlight with this piece which is then just as much as we see corals and mm -hmm. all these larger animals, such as fish on a reef, there's equally as important members, which is all the microorganisms also that make up this critical ecosystem, which is what I've drawn on top of the coral, but also mm -hmm. the transitions between them. So there's healthy coral versus bleached coral. And you can kind of see like somewhat of a graveyard in the back. There's all these broken yeah. pieces. And then ecosystem wide shifts. So moving from a healthy reef to something dominated by macroalgae. So also the dynamism and dynamics you see in these spaces. Great, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, we can see, I really like the this, uh, because uh, there is this kind of a uh, multi sumo level at the same time. So we, don't, we are not keeping the right proportions of the, of the, of all, uh, all of uh, all the specimens just to show that they are present as well. So this is an idea also like uh, sometimes we measure the value of things uh, in terms of their sizes but sometimes something microscopic is doing a big part of the joy for example when we talk about nature and it's important that we also recognize their presence and their, uh, and their dynamics as well. So yeah I think this is a great uh, example of, uh, of this. Thank you Victoria. Okay let me move forward and then uh, we are here with the uh, let me just zoom in a little bit the one this one was by Matthew oh, I need to zoom in the name to s oops so, here Matthew Gimet uh, this one is called the augmented reality of forest scientist, and uh, uh, 
So this in, in this one you are seeing uh, a superposition of the forest. First a photograph in regular colors. And then you see this area here with uh, some uh, more purplish uh, greenish colors. This one is a point of cloud. So this is also a superposition of two different layers of the landscape. The one is the, the one we see through the photographs. And the second one is this uh, augmented uh, forest, which is a point, a point cloud file. So it's a, let's say they took a 3D scan and then they scan measure different points and uh, then you can have like a, a proxy of the forest. And uh, this is also a, a technique used, for example, for uh, developing measurements. Uh, the artist mentioned that they were using uh, this point of clouds to measure, uh, for example, the density of the forest, the coverage, I imagine some physical properties as well. So this is a this is a an intermediate step between. So we have the physical world, the virtual world, and this is like a more hybrid uh, augmented world. Okay, let's go here. And our next picks is by Timothy Thomanson and Benjamin Keenan. Are you present here? Uh, no. no. Okay. So in this one, uh, uh, Benjamin Keenan, he was working with uh, with uh, when I was researching the Maya lowland, and uh, he's trying to create an augmented reality experience as well, some kind of game to show how the Maya lowland looked like in the past. So you see, for example, the contrast between this environment with more hyper-realistic uh, finishes with the grass that we have in the gallery. More like a low-poly uh, aesthetics. And uh, we also have for this one... Uh, uh, this is what the, the this same file looks like before exporting. So you see that the different elements are codified in different colors. These are volumes and geometries. And then you can assign uh, materials and you can uh, get these kind of finishes. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the continuation of this project because uh, uh, yeah, there are, it's uh, a work uh, of an artist and a scientist. And uh, we have our first uh, curve here. Uh, our next piece here was created by uh, Ella Martin. Is she here? Yeah. Hi, Ella. Can you hear us? Hi. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this work and the context of it? Sure. So um, I made this drawing um, kind of right after I finished writing my thesis and the whole time that I was writing it and like trying to express these ideas through writing, um, I was like, thinking about how like other ways that I could try to like communicate some of the questions or ideas that I was thinking about. So um, yeah, this is me trying to do that. So like the first panel is kind of some of the, the questions of like biogeography as a whole that I was thinking about. And then the second two represent my, my two different chapters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, when you what when you see this piece, you instantly get this idea of different like sizes collaborating, and uh, and also like you're starting some kind of a structure. And here, for example, I'm seeing maybe you're talking about circadian rhythms and also about the the, the time or some seeds like growing. So this idea of time and space is present in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this piece. Also, I see some kind of, for example, here, some simplifications which are more, uh, which are more common in uh, cartographic elements. So I think this is a mix of a, of, a, of a map and a garden. I really like it. Uh, thank you for, for giving us a little bit of content, Ella. Let's go to our next piece here. Our next piece is by Lind Yu. Uh, this one is called uh, Under the Microscope. And this is a digital drawing. 
and uh, the artist is uh, playing with this idea of uh, scale as well because uh, we understand the, the universe uh, you see here like some kind of shades of stars but also this image when you put it in something circular you immediately get this sense also of an image taken with a microscope which usually also have this wrong form so I like this interplay of ideas of uh, microscopic and microscopic scales at the same time. Is Lin Yu present? I don't think no. so. Okay. Yeah, you can learn more about this piece uh, through the database. What we have here... Uh, and next we have... Uh, this one was created by Morgan Puyard Galipo. This one is a uh, neurological woods and uh, it's a digital drawing as well. And uh, yeah, I imagine you can get also a sense of uh, of uh, a forest mm -hmm. when, when you see this uh, when you see this piece. So yeah, this kind of uh, piece uh, pieces are also taking advantage of the similarities. Uh, in the different uh, organizations that we find in nature, for example. So we have these uh, shapes with um, branches which are present in uh, more, a lot of organic uh, components. And then uh, it, it, this one also makes me feel uh, like, uh, yeah, there is of course something that we don't understand about the forest as well, about the plants uh, that inhabit the forest. So when you see here our brain, you can also think about like, um, yeah, maybe this is how, like how the forest communicate. So you can also get really close to the pieces and see more detail as well. And we have here uh, chimney tops by Brian, which is present. If I yeah, Brian is here. Hi, Brian. Hello. How are you? Not too bad. <laughs> Do you want to talk about your piece? Sure. So um, the the image is just a, a digital photograph. I didn't um, use any other sort of media within the file, mm -hmm. but um, it captures a small face of a range in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Mm -hmm. um, I captured this with a uh, digital camera using um, a kind of new technique in digital photography, which is called sensor, sensor shifting, where okay. if your camera has uh, image stabilization, it might have a mode where it lets you sort of move the sensor around in the camera and stitch together a really large file um, in a single exposure. Oh, wow. Um, so you do you do you, oh, go ahead. Do you modify the camera to do that? No, so I have a Panasonic G9. It's actually the camera I'm recording this on right now, or like that is acting as my webcam. Um, and it has a mode that does that. It's not unique to that camera, so other ones do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it relies on this ability for the whole sensor to just move around. So it's only been a thing in the past like 10 years or something. I think uh, this is a new form in landscape photography that's becoming pretty popular. Mm -hmm. um, so with these large files, I then stitched multiple of those together to create an overall image that has uh, ridiculous detail. I mean, like, uh, yeah, you don't, yeah, I think, file. I think this image, uh, like there is also a restriction. We were talking about the, 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 the virtual world. So there is a restriction in terms of, of the size of the files. So unfortunately the, the, the version that we have here, you don't see as much detail as we see in the real, uh, photography that, uh, Brian submitted. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you, yeah, you can really get this uh, immensity of the landscape through this uh, this technique. I never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. And so the name you. chimney tops refers mm -hmm. to um, the, so this face faces, uh, I believe, west, and so the opposite side being east. Um, and the, the local people in uh, northwest Tennessee decided to call this place chimney tops because um, the fog and clouds coming from the east side uh, roll up the edge and along the peak, so especially uh, along that left uh, peak that um, looks kind of triangular, uh, mm -hmm. the smoke gets like funneled up that direction. And so it looks like chimney tops out of the um, each peak. 
Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. So yeah, thank you nice for between yeah. atmospheric physics and uh, my reason for taking the photograph. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Let's see what we have here. Uh, next, we have uh, another written piece. This one is uh, called uh, Song of the Flowers by Natalie. I'm not sure if it's Ko or Tso. Is she here? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'll let you read the, the, the song. I'm not, I don't know if you're supposed to sing it. Maybe you can try uh, to find a way <laughs> for it. Let's move to the next uh, piece. Oh, this one, it's uh, like uh, in terms of the physical. So this uh, exhibition is showing a mixture of uh, physical and digital works. And uh, this is our biggest uh, physical uh, work. This one it's, uh, was created by Anna Dawson Harrington uh, a few years ago. And uh, it depicts uh, the Devonian and Carboniferous flora of Eastern Canada. So you can also see here the piece uh, hanging at the Red Palm Museum. Uh, so here you can have a, a, a little bit of an idea of the dimensions of this piece. Uh, it, me it measures almost three meters of uh, height. And uh, actually this piece is uh, kept uh, at the at McGill University uh, in a collection. And uh, you can imagine uh, because of uh, their construction and material and also of its age, uh, it's quite fragile. So we are able to manipulate it here in the physical world without, without damaging the piece. Uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing it in, uh, in a physical location as well uh, soon. And uh, also about this piece, uh, this piece is uh, one sheet uh, of a collection of uh, almost 30. Uh, they were used uh, in the context of teaching. So they will uh, like hang these uh, big sheets and then uh, uh, with retro, like with light from behind, you can uh, illuminate the piece and uh, have a, a teaching session. So it's some kind of a projection as well. Uh, let me move here. Here we have a photography. This one was created by Victor Tishon. Sorry if I didn't pronounce well your name. Are you here, Victor? Hi, Victor. Uh, can you tell me how to pronounce your name? And tell sure, us? it's Chisholm. Chisholm, okay. So we have Victor Chisholm. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this piece? Thank you, Milton. I was on a hike with some friends in uh, early October. Uh, it was in Fore Waro, north of Montreal. Mm -hmm. And toward the end of my hike, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. Toward the end of my hike, I saw this red leaf on the ground and I just pulled out my iPhone and uh, took a snapshot. I also had my film camera with me that day but uh, my film is still pending developing. I think there's a okay, materials okay. shortage supply and I'm still waiting to get that film back. So I might have a, a film version of this one in the future. Anyway, oh, okay. um, uh, it was the color of, of, the, of the leaf that, that caught my attention and I snapped it. But when I looked at this picture afterwards, I thought of it as a still life um, in, the, in the classical sense, as best I understand art, art history, where um, the idea of a still life was to freeze in time that which is inherently uh, transitory and evanescent and so you know if, if you look in closer you'll see not only the the leaf which is in the prop ha has died and is dying but you'll see leaves needles from um, and from conifers other other leaves living lichens mosses uh, it also shows us um, a, a really uh, large uh, a lot of evolution going on and uh, different forms of plant life um, and the rock itself testifies to uh, lots and lots of passage of time and, and transformations beyond scales that we can really understand. So um, the, although Milton talked about earlier about uh, different physical scales that other artists have captured, mm -hmm. um, it was the seen and the unseen in the temporal dimension that, that appealed to me. 
as 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 a scientific um, way of seeing this picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Victor, for this introduction. Uh, also, I think uh, this piece is connected with this idea of uh, seeing and watching, because uh, like uh, with current technologies, we are uh, losing and losing more connection with the physical world. And for example, we are finding also like uh, things to replace. Uh, for example, when we take a picture, we rarely see what it's present. We do it afterwards through the through the photography. So, yeah, uh, thank you for 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 the words, Victor. Thank you, Milton. Uh, we have a uh, Viola Rizier. Let me see. Just a second. Uh, are you present, Viola? Yes, hello. Sorry, I'm a bit in the dark. Uh, <laughs> but, well, could, very good. Could you just remind me the name of your piece? Uh, uh, so. Yeah, it was called, I think it was a uh, lost page from Darwin's Field Notes. Yeah, I need to hear, listen to the name to, to be able to find it. <laughs> so, right here. You're really close to Red Palm Museum. Uh, let me just move a little bit here. So we have a. Uh, I'm doing a little. Uh, the computer is taking me where he wants. I don't know what's happening. Just give me a second. Oops. Let me see if I can. I'm oh, sorry. I'm gonna reload the the, the gallery. Uh, well, let's do something different with you, Viola. Can you tell us a little bit about your piece, and then we show uh, the piece <laughs> as yeah. on the website? Um, yeah. So um, basically, it's a collection of imaginary. Um, I think it was mainly animals in this one, mm -hmm. um, but a, a while ago, um, I just started doodling animals and plants in my notebooks um, if I was born in class um, and I got really into doing that and I, I think that one of the coolest parts about science especially the natural sciences um, in like the 1800s 1700s were the botanical and zoological drawings that I just find absolutely beautiful aside from being of like pretty important scientific value but also just very very pretty and I think that it's a bit of a shame that um, drawing has become less important in many sciences and so I just kind of loosely based on that idea and also just the fact that I like drawing animals um, mm -hmm. especially imaginary ones uh, oh. uh, was what I was trying to to recreate with this uh, piece okay let's see if people here thank you thank you Bella. Uh, yeah so what I like about this piece as well is the playfulness of it like uh, you're also doing your own interpretations of how uh, life could have evolved in an imaginary world or maybe in this one we don't know maybe in some generations it will become like that uh, uh, and yeah I think it's really really playful um, and you were saying as well that uh, photography has been replacing uh, like in communication, especially in books, there is this uh, discussion about uh, which is the most ideal uh, tool to communicate in, for example, scientific uh, ideas and topics. And uh, like sometimes an illustration uh, does a more clear word in communication because it's also a simplification. And uh, so you really need to pay attention and to capture the most fundamental details uh, of your subject. So I think you're doing a great job here. Uh, let's keep drawing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me go back to where I was. Uh, um, we have also this uh, acrylic paint on canvas. Let me see which uh, here by Teresa Grossman, Tessa Grossman, sorry. I don't know if she's present here. She wanted to capture uh, the energy of the sun. 
and uh, you see an aquatic landscape as well here. Acrylic paint, yeah. And uh, I'm going back here. This is uh, Ingrid Broker piece. I don't know if you want to say something about this piece, Ingrid. Now that we are back here. Oh, thanks, Milton. It w really was just an experiment on a snowy day, and, and I just had um, from Christmas the last year. It was January 1st, and a snowstorm was coming in, and I looked out the window, and where the snow was, um, against the water being the, the lake and then the hills behind it, um, I just experimented with lots of super saturating the, this paper, this aquarelle paper with lots and lots of water and trying out my different new pigment tubes. And, uh, and then I had read about alcohol, adding alcohol or salt, coarse salt onto the wet surface of a, of an, um, a watercolor. And it really was just to, to see what would happen. And this is what resulted and <laughs> it looks way better on screen than in reality. So thanks oh, really? for putting it in the gallery. Okay, I see some, uh, are those uh, the salt grains? Yes, so the oh, salt yeah. seems to concentrate the color, like pulls it in, whereas alcohol disperses it. The alcohol makes mm -hmm. it, you know, pull, blossom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting technique in green that yeah, might have also many applications as well. So yeah, please keep doing your experiments and uh, sharing with us. Let's go to the next uh, piece. Right here we have a... Oops. We already talked about Mammoth's kissing, but I don't know if Louis Philippe is present. I don't think so. Let's go to our next piece is... Uh, um, this one's called Ivory by... Uh, I cannot quite read the name, let me just oops. close this. It's by Sonia or Sotira, and she's not here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah this one, it's uh, I think it's charcoal, but I'm uh, let me see, I need to replace this car. So, Rihanna, I'm gonna replace it, and uh, it will be up in a little time. Then uh, we have a collection of three digital photographies. These were created by uh, Sarah Ford. I don't know if she's present. She is. Hi, Sarah. Hi. How are you? I'm good, you? I'm fine, thank you. Please go ahead and speak a little bit about your pieces. Uh, yeah, so these are just a few um, wildlife photographs of local wildlife in my neighborhood in the West Island of Montreal. Uh, the goal behind them is really just to show pretty common animals that we might see pretty often in urban and suburban landscapes and just kind of show them in a different light that reveals their beauty and the details of them that people might not always notice um, yeah. to show that they are truly, really beautiful and also really ecologically important as well. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I think you have a really good eye to frame to frame the, the pictures. You can really like frame your subject and uh, but also like you are not just subtracting the subject from the environment but you also have the environment present uh, in some level so I really like that and the details are really great <laughs> the raccoon it's really beautiful so thank yeah thank you Sarah for this uh, introduction uh, let me go here just Oh uh, yeah, uh, our next piece is uh, by Jessica Four. Hi, Jessica. Hey there, Milton. How are you? Good. You got the sisters one after the other. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that was not in purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this this is a piece I actually made uh, back in my Sage Up days. I was in an arts and science program, and for our final projects, we had to combine what we learned about. The arts and the sciences and bring them together. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm currently a, a PhD candidate. Now I'm a herpetologist. So I study reptiles and amphibians. Um, and this is a sea turtle hybrid and what I imagined it would look like based on literature of 
um, sea turtles and how they hybridize, which are most likely to hybridize together, what pre-zygotic and post-zygotic barriers may stop them, things like that. Okay. Um, so I, I created this animal based on my imagination of what they may look like. And I think that it is a good showcase of um, art and science in that regard, because I combine them, but also in that we, as scientists, don't need to limit ourselves to only science, and we can also do art and be creative in, in our tasks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that introduction, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica, uh, uh, when we started this, um, the call for participants, I also thought that she was submitting more pieces because uh, I know you have a lot of uh, experience with uh, outreaching and uh, with science communication and also with uh, communication with kids. So, yeah, please uh, visit. I don't know how people can get in contact with you, but uh, Jessica does a lot of uh, creative stuff in uh, as part of uh, her uh, scientific research and practice as well. So, we should yeah. also let everyone know, Milton, that Jessica mm -hmm. Ford is responsible for creating a STEM coloring book, mm -hmm. and she will be gifting that on behalf of Sci Art 200. That's oh, what great. it looks like. We were hoping to get hard copies to be able to send them to all the artists. We can't do that, unfortunately. There is a paper shortage. Or anyway, you will. Jessica will make sure every single artist who submitted a piece will get a PDF version. They're available in French and English. You'll get a PDF in both language versions, so you can have some coloring fun over the holidays. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I have a question, Jessica. Is this one the one in which you have a uh, different type of scientist? Sure, we'll just do a project for the coloring book. Um, yeah, so it's STEM Diversity, which is another program um, that I run that shows the diversity of science and scientists. Part of that is that scientists can be very creative as well, um, but it features draw yourself as a scientist activities mm. uh, like these. So drawing yourself as different kinds of scientists and different things scientists do. It features activities about privilege and equity and how that can differ based on things like the color of your skin or your upbringing or your nationality. Um, and it also features activities on the um, research of famous um, scientists that are from underrepresented backgrounds that you can do um, so that you can find those here as well. So I'll be sending everyone digital copies. If you really want physical copies, we should have them again in January, our stock ran out before the pandemic and we haven't been able to print more yet, um, but we are working on it. I'll send details of that, but thank, thank you, Wilton, for the, the promo. Yeah, great. Yeah, because I was also thinking that, uh, um, yeah, I, I learned about uh, Jessica's uh, book and uh, she wanted, like, the way in which she wanted to communicate to kids that uh, being a scientist is not only having a white coat and being in a lab, but uh, you can do <laughs> almost whatever you want. Uh, like you can uh, choose the technique that you want. Uh, you can incorporate uh, as many disciplines as you want in your uh, research. So I think this exhibition is also a good example of the diversity of uh, works and uh, techniques and uh, messages uh, that are created by uh, the scientific community. Let's go here. Uh, we have uh, our next piece, it's called uh, the model organism. This one is a uh, painting with uh, pencil crayons. Do we have Emma here? Emma Rose Chile. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Emma. Hi. So, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good. So, tell us a little bit about uh, your piece. So my piece is called the model organism. And so a lot of time in science or in research, we work with model organisms such as mice, um, zebra fish and fruit flies. Mm -hmm. And so currently I actually work with mice to model uh, leukemia, but I thought I would focus more on the fly and just try to show the beauty of these creatures that often dedicate their lives to really furthering our um, scientific discoveries on human disease or certain biological processes. So mm -hmm. I tried to show the beauty. <laughs> oh, thank you. Great. Yeah, and uh, you were saying that this is an organism that is often uh, forgotten. I think so. And also not really appreciated as well. So 
I think you portrayed it beautifully. Thank you for uh, submitting this piece. No problem. Okay, let's go to our, I think, uh, how are we doing on time? Can I, have, can I have a time check, please? You have um, seven minutes, Milton. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe I, I think uh, I want I want to go with the artists that are present, and then uh, like uh, I show you, we are only halfway the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go with the artists that are here, uh, and then uh, I'll let you visit the website by yourself and to explore the works and discover more about all the artists. Uh, we have Lily. Lily, are you here? Yeah. Hi. Bad Kitty by Lily Cronover. Go ahead, Lily. Um, so this is an acrylic painting, and it's based on recent evidence that shows that saber-toothed cats pierced the skulls of their rivals with their saber teeth. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my motivations for studying archaeology and geology is the amount of color and motion that I see in things that people usually regard as inanimate or like dead. Mm -hmm. um, so this painting is an expression of my appreciation for how beauty and brutality coexist in nature. Mm, okay. How do you how do you how do you get to that article about the the saber? Uh, how yeah. Or I don't remember. It? it was, I mean, it was like two years ago. But you um, got excited about it and uh, then did the painting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you for being here with us, uh, Lily. I thank hope you. you. You enjoyed the 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 exhibition as well. Uh, who else is present? Let me see. Jose. Jose yeah. Bustamante. Okay. Hi, Jose. Um, hi Milton, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Can you just remind me the name of your piece so I can go? Um, okay, yeah, so the piece is called uh, Solidarity. Yeah, I think yeah. you have it on the right. Um, uh, uh, sorry, on your left. Yeah, yeah it is It is a black and white um, photograph. Uh, here. There you go, yeah, that is the one. Okay, tell us a little bit about this piece, Jose. Um, okay, so in, in the last few years, I've been working on a lab where we build uh, atomic force microscopes. And, and these are microscopes that can measure a single atom. Mm -hmm. So in the process of building these this complicated machines, uh, lots of tools are involved. Um, and, and these tools inspired me to imagine mechanical creatures that build other machines and repair them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so in this in this picture, I saw, I, I was just trying to fix my watch, and I saw how these characters were repairing um, another machine, in this case, the watch. Mm -hmm. and I think that the creative process of art or science is similar to an ecosystem of interactions between tools and ideas. Mm -hmm. I think the image shows a tender solidarity between them. So in the context of a building scientific instrumentation, I've been creating these imaginary worlds and stories. And this picture is just a snapshot, a snapshot mm -hmm. in the life of these worlds. Okay, great. great. Thank you for that introduction, Jose. Uh, I was recently reading about these tiny robots that could uh, replicate themselves. Have you know? Have you heard about them? Um, the I, I haven't. No, okay, sorry. yeah, that made me think about them. Some kind of tiny robots that can, yeah. I don't know how they work. Uh, <laughs> I read about them in the future. But yeah, we have a. Yeah, I, even without the title of the piece, I think we have this idea, the sense of this idea of uh, multiple uh, beings or uh, machines or organisms working together for a, for the main purpose. Yes. So uh, thank you for uh, being with us today and for your words. Thank you, Milton. Yeah. Milton, there's two more artists. Uh, okay. Kate Sheridan. Kate Sheridan is the uh, the sweater, and Dr. Rodrigo. Okay. Oh, they're really close here. So let's go with uh, Kate. 
Oops. Kate, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi, Kate. Hey. How are you? Yeah. Good. Okay, tell us a little bit about this uh, this piece. So, um, last year with COVID, I was kind of stuck in the US and all my field gear was stuck in Canada. Uh, so I needed a sweater to go to the field and I had pick up crochet as my pandemic hobby. And I was like, okay, well, let's see what happens. Um, so I, and I figured too, like, uh, the kinds of animals that I like are often not represented on clothes you buy in the store. So mm -hmm. I should take advantage of that and choose something I really like. So these are deep sea isopod um, and they're gigantic and huge and amazing. And there's a there's a famous picture on the Internet of three of these guys in a Doritos bag. So you may have seen them before. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I was able to design the back. It's basically you just make like pixel art, essentially, and mm -hmm. then yeah. You can then as you stitch you alternate the colors um and then while i was in the field i was where i wore it the whole time and uh there's a couple of shots here of my field notebook that i drew while i was i was wearing the the sweater so we were driving around on the boat and it was cold and wet and uh for a long time <laughs> so i would just make sketches as we were going just kind of in the in the field so it was just kind of like a back and forth process of like making art to go in the field, making feel work in the field. And now I've already got a plan for uh, another sweater. So <laughs> started that one, got, got a few rows. Great. But based on my field experience. Yeah, I think it's a good reflection as well of the this idea of time. Like you're mentioning that you it took you an amount of hours, but you were also using these hours uh, for lectures, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh... oh yeah, right. <laughs> I did a lot of that work was done during Zoom meetings. <laughs> like yeah, that's what one. I wanted to say. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I this is like the materialization of uh, the Zoom meetings. <laughs> yeah. Like the passage of time, and I think <laughs> this is a perfect way of communicating. I imagine you receive a lot of questions from people uh, when you were wearing the sweater, the jacket, the field jacket. So. Yeah, there weren't too many people in the field, so not too many people have seen it yet. But now that the weather is getting cold, I'm going to be wearing it back and forth all the time. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, so please, for uh, you can invite those people to this exhibition to see uh, the rest of uh, your images here. Thank you yeah. for uh, this introduction, Kate. Thanks. And keep, uh, keep, keep, um, uh, I forgot the verb. Keep doing this uh, amazing work. Uh... I'm going with uh, Rodrigo and Eric, Rodrigo and Eric Reyes. Are you here? Yes. Hey I'm there. here. Uh, fine. Uh, I have my uh, video, but if uh, my connection is not very good, so if I we can, the sound we, starts, we can see you and hear you. All right. So uh, my my connection is not very good. So I'll just uh, turn off the video. My brother is okay. here. So um, actually, my brother is Eric, and um, and uh, so so the the the, the piece uh, is a part of a collaboration that we have because I'm I have a, I'm a scientist. I have a lab in bio, and and he's an artist, and so. A couple of years ago, he came to visit the lab and uh, he spent two weeks uh, and we tried uh, coming up with uh, some like, collaborations to, to do together. And, and this is part of this, like of, of what has uh, resulted of, of, out of this uh, visit he has. So what you are saying in here, it's, um, it's, it's a model of uh, something that my lab works on, which is uh, what we are trying to understand is how cells copy their DNA. And uh, mm. there's a, a lot of different components uh, um, working to do that. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the idea we play in here is that a lot of this information, even though that it's, um, it's, it's uh, the best we know, the, uh, some, like, is the some of it incorporates some of the latest 
um, information about this process, um, we, I mean, it's all imagination because a lot of the techniques we use, uh, we don't we don't see them directly. We we don't see these uh, uh, proteins directly. We we take information from different techniques, but, uh, and then we infer it, and then we make models. So we here we are playing with the idea that uh, we we imagine the models uh, in a certain way, but we could for sure um, uh, imagine them uh, in a different way. And the problem is that uh, we we present the, the information with, with a model and then people take this model and then just perpetuate it. So, but I mean, it's it's a little bit of a thing. So um, uh, how much we change the model, the aesthetics of this model and maintain uh, the information it, it contains. And okay. if my brother is here, he could uh, tell, tell you a little bit more about uh, the uh, shapes yeah, we used. Hi, Eric. Can you hear us, Eric? Maybe he can't. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just say uh, I, he took a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Milton. Hi, hi Rodrigo. Hi, Eric. Yeah. Hey. Uh, yeah. Well, I I used some um, shapes that come from uh, seeds and other uh, vegetable parts. Mm -hmm. um, and well, I, I maintain the the idea of the models that Rodrigo uses in his uh, laboratory, um, and basically I was just playing with the idea of the visualization of these uh, models, and um, and just making a fantastic uh, surreal world after this. Um, uh, scientific models mm -hmm. and well it, it's it's just a game okay yeah how was this uh, interaction with the scientist the well when i first came to his uh, laboratory in 2019 uh, basically i just wanted to to see what they were doing and to propose something for for the future because um well, it's a very complex world and I didn't feel like um, I had uh, tools for communicating with uh, with scientists in this very complicated and technological uh, environment. But um, I don't know, I, I, I think um, there's a lot of things to, to think about from, from art. And being critical also with the scientists and with science, I, I think it's not only to um, to maintain a very optimistic um, communication, but instead of um, making a problematization of of, of this relationship. You know? So I think there's a lot of, of um, things to be said still from this um, relationship uh, uh, of arts with science, no? So, mm -hmm. well, I don't know, I'm just um, thinking about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, uh, like, maybe also, like, I don't know if you have this uh, sense of being some kind of translator for the scientists? Like, well, yes, this, this mainly, this work, this work mainly is, is a translation, yes. Uh, I didn't, um, how to say, I, I didn't uh, make my own interpretation. Instead, mm -hmm. I was using his um, his uh, model mm -hmm. and I, I didn't, I, I just changed the shapes he had, um, but, but I wasn't um, expressing in, in a very um, wide term. Uh, so I, I was using his his idea and his shapes and his um, map mm -hmm. of of this chromosomic environment <laughs> mm -hmm. and in transforming it in in, in a very uh, in a more um, a common in, in daily life objects. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I used a scanner. Uh, you know this uh, basic scanner that everyone has in, 
at home. And I scanned some some seeds and make a, made a, a, an amplification of the seeds in a, in a way like the scientists do in, in, in with microscopes, but mm -hmm. I, I, I was using just a very simple Tools. artifacts and materials and mm -hmm. yeah, you know, uh, in, in, in ink and watercolor. I, I was like, um, that's another thing I, I, I thought when I was in his laboratory that um, not, not many people have this um, connection with, uh, with high technology. So um, I don't know, I, I just wanted to, to make a very simple, uh, using very simple instruments for, for making this um, representation of a very complex and high technology um, um, visualizations. No? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that you. Uh, explanation, uh, <laughs> Eric. Uh, amazing work. And uh, yeah, I think you did a good job on the, uh, translating and also like uh, making the, the model more accessible. To, to, to all people. Uh, we have, Thank you, Milka. Uh, uh, you're welcome. We have a couple of arches left. Uh, I think we have to close very soon. So let's just move to Benjamin Rutsky, The Forecation on Canvas, 2021. Hi, Benjamin. Hi. So this piece of art is actually a visualization of a mass, of be different behaviors of a mathematical model. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into too much detail because it's a bit complicated to explain, but the areas that are lighter in color represent sets of parameters for which the model settles down onto just a few values and the darker areas indicate more aperiodic behavior. And so this is something that's very commonly seen in dynamical systems. You wind up with these complicated bifurcation diagrams that just, wind up being very beautiful pieces of art. Another well-known example is the Mandelbrot set. Mm -hmm. So I made this for an assignment and I just thought it looked really beautiful and I figured that it would be a really good contribution. So it's a work of math that's also a work of art. Yeah, where does the symmetry come from? I see there is a symmetry in the middle here. Was, I'm not... was that in purpose or? Uh... I think it might be due to properties of the mathematical model but I'm not entirely sure, but it's definitely something that would be worth more investigation because really there are so many secrets to what's shown in this picture that could take so long to uncover with the math. Okay. Yeah, I imagine we can read more about this piece uh, in, the, in, the, in the database. So yeah, I'm going to read more about it now that you've given this explanation. Thank you for uh, participating, Benjamin. I hope you can keep exploring these uh, representations of mathematical models. Or, uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing your uh, next uh, explorations. Uh, um, Sidar, I'm moving to the next uh, piece. Uh, let me see, we have, uh... oh, who am I missing, sorry. Um, do you have Annie Ziru Chu? Her piece was um, yeah, I have it here. pencil drawing called math. Uh, oh no, it's uh, the other way. We have, uh, let's go with her. Or them, I don't know, sorry, if I miss a sign general. Uh, where is it? Oh, here I think. Oh yeah, I have this. Um, this was the corner of the science sci scientists uh, portraits. So you see, uh, we have different <laughs> versions of a scientist in this uh, in this uh, corner of the lower field. But we are talking right now about this piece by uh, Annie. Hi, Annie. Martin, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Oops, sorry. Rachel, also known as Annie. And um, 
So let me go to these two pieces. Mm -hmm. Milton, we can't see them. Yeah. We're frozen. I don't oh. know if you are. You might Sorry. have to reboot it again. Yeah, give me a second and I'm going to reload the, the, the site. Okay? I can introduce Ania because I interviewed her. Oh, her pieces sure. are very personal. These are the, she did these drawings intermittently while studying math. Math became um, very, um, a very uh, iconic figure and uh, math became a person, became a good friend to her. Um, these drawings are just a small little bit of how she feels about math. She's incorporated many elements of math into her pencil drawings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just get quickly to her piece. Uh... Yes, Madame. So does I depict mass as a being who is useful and elegant. Mm -hmm. So my story with mass, the journey, it, it is not always easy. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to me, but I appreciate the fact that mass is always there with me. And to me, mass is just like a friend who is always sincere and lovely. Yeah, there you, there we have uh, the drawing. So you see that uh, and it draws also dif draws some different uh, kinds of math grouped by uh, different topics, right? So we have here calculus. Oh, this is one uh, I need to uh, flip it. We have uh, linear algebra, probability, statistics, and. Uh, and it's using different math symbols as, as well uh, to create this kind of portraits of mathematics. So yeah, thank you Annie for your, your words. Uh, it's great having you here. I hope uh, you can uh, keep uh, this relationship with math. Uh, yeah, thank you Annie. Let's uh, go to, yeah, I think uh, all the last piece. What am I missing? Um, Lin Yu has asked if her piece is around. Lin Yu, L I N L I U. Uh, uh, I think we already talked about uh, this. Oh, okay. Let's go over there. Oh, I haven't shared the link yet, so in a few minutes I'm going to be posting the link so you can all visit the... Hi, Lynn. Oh, uh, hi. Can you hi. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, because there's only a little bit of time, so I'll just explain just just a little bit, okay? Okay, So, well. Okay. Um, well, uh, as you guys can see, there's some microscope view, right? Uh, but like in, inside of microscope, it's really a universe. What I mean is that like the science is really a mystery because I'm still a U1 student here. So uh, like whatever the science or school or uh, like my subject is still a mystery, like uh, it's still an unknown for me. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, why I put universe here is like uh, in high school, I... Mm, I'm, I, I was really interested in physics and um, I try to understand like what dark matter is or, or what dark energy is, but like people only know a little bit about this, though yeah. uh, those two things compose like probably 95% of the world. So, um, so we're still exploring that. Um, mm -hmm. But like for now, uh, I'm I'm studying for microbiology and immunology. Um, we are still exploring for those micro, like those real little things. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, yeah, so we can only see through, uh, uh, through the microscope. So I think both things are uh, kind of like the similar because we're still exploring them. We're still finding the mystery inside of them. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's my idea for this piece of art. Oh, thank you, Ellie. 
Yeah, we were saying about also about this piece that uh, there is this uh, superposition of different scales. So we have the microscopic and the microscopic, macro and micro. And mm -hmm. uh, it is some sometimes also useful to to learn about the similar and different things that these different two scales uh, have, because mm -hmm. they also can give you an idea of how things might behave. But you are uh, you are certain in the fact that we know so little about uh, the reality of some uh, subjects as the universe. So yeah, thank you for uh, this uh, explanation, Elin. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm moving to the last piece. Uh, this one is by. Uh, let me go over there. Uh, I think this one is called A Gentle Reminder, but let me verify. Right here. Yeah, so our last piece today, uh, it's. Uh, a digital painting created by the, if I don't pronounce your name well, please correct me, Siddharth Sam yes. Sharma. Uh, Siddharth Sharma, yes. Hi, Milton. Sharma. Hi, Hi, everyone. How Hi. are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thank you. Please talk about this piece. Yes, yeah. Uh, so, yes, I, I came uh, this year in January, so during this pandemic. So, I wanted to symbolize this virus as a gentle reminder mm -hmm. to restore uh, the damage and tools that we humans have created, like pollution, waste. Uh, mm -hmm. It's time to think on it and like impose more development, which are sustainable. I just want to reveal a small story uh, behind the creation of this image. So on my first day, I, uh, I visited a senior, my senior in the department for dinner, and he showed me a picture, a painting of an elephant. And mm -hmm. I was really mesmerized by it. And I told him that I paint as well. And he challenged me, he, he like, he poked me like, if he could paint something uh, as good as this, or even if he could paint something, or, uh, something. So I, I worked on this drawing like for one month and I sent it to him. Mm -hmm. And then well, he revealed that the painting which I saw in his apartment was actually a, uh, a, a product from Amazon that he bought. It is not something that he drew. So yes, that, that challenge like it triggered me to draw this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah, I see you also using some kind of a, like a, there is this similarity between the virus. The image, uh, this image is everywhere right now the image of the virus, but also like the planet as a sphere with these uh, little peaks which are showing different kinds of uh, pressures over the environment, pollution, we have uh, some nuclear energy, I imagine some construction, uh, fuel extraction, so yeah, to think about this kind of relationships and uh, the pressure that we're putting on the environment. It's a great uh, reminder, actually. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm adding a last piece uh, before we leave because the artists are also present. Uh, this one is called Vivi Scientists. It's in the scientists uh, area. Let me see where it is. Uh, and then we can. Uh, I don't know if you already have the link of the of the. Of the website, I see some people already joining. Just give me a little. Oops. Milton, is it's a bit at your at your left. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was saying that it's in the in the scientist corner. That's it, exactly. Uh, here. Well, actually, yeah, not the scientist corner, but the 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 corner with the porches of scientists. Uh, right here. Yeah, this piece is very interesting and also complicated. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the piece? Yes, so I don't know if you find I'm the artist that uh, I worked with you find who's the scientist and it's a collaborative piece. Mm -hmm. So I, she told me that her internet was unstable. So you find you can just jump in. I guess I'll start. 
Um, she, I think she was a PhD student in linguistic and I, we took a class together called the Convergence Initiative at Concordia. It's, it was like mm -hmm. McGill and uh, Concordia students working together. And, uh, and we work on this piece. Uh, we try to, to see, to imitate a bit how babies learn with the mm -hmm. mother or with the caretaker, the main caretaker. And so the first, so these first set of paintings she did, she was like the baby and I was like the mother, like okay. the teacher. <laughs> and she, the first session, I didn't say a word. I took the image, it's actually her lab where she studies babies and, and their language acquisition and all of this. So mm -hmm. we took images from that, use it as a reference. And then I would paint and she would just look at me. I would say no um, instructions at all. She would really just look, no comment, no feedback. So we did this once, look, we looked at the results and then the second set of uh, baby paintings, then I would offer feedback and she would ask questions. So we worked a bit on that. The sizes, so she worked on a much smaller canvas. I work on a mm. bigger one. And I think we can see it a bit there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we saw the results, like it's a lot more, uh, uh, it was better when I was able to give her feedback and instruction. So mm, that was great. before, that was just pre-pandemic and then the pandemic happened, but the class wasn't done. So we had a whole other part to the project, which is the graphite uh, drawing next to them. And the first mm -hmm. session was with um, a YouTube video pre-recorded. She would watch it. It was with the, the virus. So like, we went with the theme and then she would do it just watching the YouTube video. And then it was a live, like a Zoom, but it, it was at the beginning of Zoom. So we had a lot of technical difficulties. I was trying to interact with her as we were drawing the nurse. So I think her drawings are on the, the right and mine okay. on the the left so yes yeah. so yeah it was interesting for sure yeah um mm -hmm. i don't know if she's there she can add something yeah i'm here um i think you did a terrific job to explain everything um and just one correction i'm a student at the faculty of medicine um school. oh i'm sorry <laughs> no no it's a inter very interdisciplinary so yeah um i hope everyone enjoy great so yeah, uh, you can read more about the piece. There is the description about like uh, the different uh, learning processes and drawing processes that they use as well uh, in the database. So thank you for this uh, introduction. Yeah, I see more uh, similarities. For example, when you say that you are doing the the feedback uh, in the drawings, like there is a different kind of uh, quality of the image that you can get when when you provide this feedback. Uh, so thank you. I'm adding a last one, but this is the last, last, last one. Uh, this one is uh, uh, by Nilu Far. And then uh, you're free to go and explore the gallery by yourself. So let me just quickly go over here. Right here. Uh, so we have uh, two different, uh, actually we'll have also a video here, let me play it. Hi Nilufar, am I pronouncing well your name? Yes, hi everybody. Please uh, briefly speak, uh, tell us something about your piece. Yeah, uh, my piece uh, was mainly based on the photorealism uh, drawing and I used to draw by charcoal like more than 10 years but during the COVID time I started to work on this specific method which mm -hmm. uh, as in like an international dentist and right now as a student at the dental school this type of drawing just gonna improve my manual dexterity and my visions and my imaginations when I'm gonna working. Mm -hmm and uh, restoring the tooth because uh, I love to draw anatomy. I love to draw tooth morphology, which has helped me a lot to improve my work. And, and even recently in some school in US, they had some like an, a drawing course for the dental student as well. I hope that someday we could have that one in McGill as well, mm -hmm. because specifically for dentistry, art is in like a crucial things that if you know you're gonna be a better dentist, 
in the future as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, this one, um, it's like around like 35 hours took my time to finish it. But thank God it was COVID and I have a lot of time at home to work on that. <laughs> And the other one that we can see, it's like an, like an implant surgery, which yeah. is like, yeah, this one. You can see here. Um, it's like a scene for the implant surgery and you can see the different type of the tooth as well. Uh, and I normally, even in the daily day, even with like a simple piece of paper and a simple pen, I used to draw. I just look at the teeth and then draw and, um, kind of improve my visions mm-hmm. yeah i think uh, the the level of detail that you can get with those drawing it's amazing Thank it's you. uh yeah it's uh you even have for example with the eye even more detail than it's present uh in the like you double the, the level of detail it's something in the the quality of your drawings Thank you. so yeah please keep drawing and uh i hope to see your work in the future Thank you so much. And thank you for those words. So, yeah, uh, I think we're about to finish today. I went to the sky a little bit uh, just to show you uh, a view of the of the whole exhibition space. We are located in the lower field. Uh, you can also explore. I added a bunch of buildings uh, here. So only the Rectal Museum and the Bursa and Hall had, ha, have windows, but then... Uh, I imagine maybe the building in which you study your work might be present as well in this exhibition. So, thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, please uh, visit the, the exhibition. Remember that there is a database uh, in the entry of the, of the, of the gallery. Uh, through this database, you can learn more about all the pieces uh, the techniques that the artists use, the context in which they were created. So that's all for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Milton. This was all a volunteer effort on Milton's part. Oh, he yeah. was corralled I, into this. <laughs> no, but also, I forgot to mention that uh, this uh, couldn't uh, couldn't be possible without the help of the, a group of student volunteers. Uh, can you read the names of the student volunteers, Ingrid? Oh, I can't. I don't have them all in front of me, but they know who they are. There were 10 dedicated student volunteers who interviewed our artists. It took them easily an hour's worth of interview. They did at least five or six interviews. Over 60 pieces were submitted, and you can see how Milton's arranged them in this gallery. This gallery will be up for at least two or three years. This this actual launch where we got to hear from the artists will be preserved on McGill's YouTube channel forever. You can watch and hear about the pieces. Do explore within this week so that we can get your polling results. This week only, we are voting for the people's choice. And that's you. You enter the gallery and you get to vote. We'll close that poll on Friday, the 17th of December. December, we'll announce that winner in January. There will be a jury an official Sci Art 200 jury. They will be people at McGill who will be pre- uh, evaluating and then a jury prize will also be awarded at the same time, probably end of January, 2022. So once again, first of all, Milton, thank you so much for creating this great exploration space, science and art coming to life in a whole different way than we've ever had before. Um, To all the participants, all the artists who submitted, to the uh, student volunteers who helped us to pull together the, the documentation that was needed to make this, to contextualize everything that's in this virtual gallery. And last but not least, um, uh, Ken Reagan, he is in, the, in physics at McGill, he is the chair of the Faculty of Science Bicentennial Committee. They, he came wandering around the Red Path Museum a few years ago and said to me, I heard we could probably do an art show for the Bicentennial. So if he hadn't done that, I think it was late 2018, maybe early 2019, um, this could not have happened. It did start with someone who used to work here, a man named Torsten Bernhardt is um, 
to be noted, he did set up the very first submissions, um, the option to submit a piece that was January 2021. We closed it with Milton as curator, October 31st, 2021. And here are the results. Wonderful way to see science. Wow, I feel like I've just taken intro to, to art. Yes, uh, thank you, Ingrid, for those closing words. Uh, just a final thing, uh, I'm going to put uh, a link here with all the names of the student volunteers that oh, thanks. Help, uh, help us construct this uh, project. So please enjoy the gallery. I see some of you are already exploring how to navigate. Some of you are going through the floor. If you go through the floor, let me show you. You will see like the bottom part of the model. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, point uh, towards the, the, the ceiling or the sky and uh, press, press W and that uh, should take you back to the, to the floor. You can also enter the buildings and see what's inside. Most of, most of them have nothing, but uh, yeah. I'm going to stop this. Thank you, Milton. Thank time. you, Andrew. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank enjoy you. the enjoy the exhibition and share it with your friends and family as well and colleagues bye Anne. thank you bye annie thank bye, you everyone. have a nice day thank you. Thank you. have a nice evening you too bye, bye Anne marie bye have thank a good you. week <laughs> thank you bye, bye annie